What's up everybody, Kosho here. Today's video is about what if Deku had a blood quirk part 31. The title of the fanfiction we will be listening to is Blood for the Blood God and it's by Ryujin Mao on fanfiction.net. So please go check out the fanfiction and the author in the description and support them for making this great story. And make sure to join the discord in the description. But anyways let's start this story. UA School Grounds, Infirmary Room 13.37 AM, Lunch Break This is The elder nurse found herself short on words, her eyes focused on the apparel dangling from the vampire's neck. Quirks oppressing devices were heavily regulated by the government for obvious reasons, which also meant that new information on them was also hard to come by. So far the most commonly known and used device was the coffin-like, Iron Maiden, used when dealing with uncooperative and truly dangerous criminals. Metamaterials were rare, and those who could work with them even more so. The rarity of the devices meant that information about them was only shared to those that needed to know. That the HSBC had pulled this kind of tech to suppress Izuku, it was suspicious. The vampire teen was powerful and controversial, but even so his acts shouldn't have warranted such measures. There was something else going on behind the scenes, Shizenji could feel it in her old bones. She had been in the hero business for the better part of her life, dealing with gruesome wounds and egocentric heroes, her mind flashed to a certain loud blonde, though the common factor there being their powerful quirks, yet, none of them had ever managed to get this type of heat on their backs. Even all might. The leading, leading nurse had a strong inkling that a certain being was still trying to make use of its influence. That old devil that very so stubbornly clung to life in a manner that couldn't be called anything other than tenacious. The elder nurse heroine sighed, massaging her eyelids to try to rid them of tension. Izuku began to button up his shirt back again, the veins in his hands visibly bulging as they strained under the pressure of holding his ill will back. It was no surprise that he was incredibly pissed off at being treated as an animal without control. The vampire had shown plenty of times that he was capable of holding himself back, of that the nurse was sure. I'm not well versed in these matters, but suffice to say, that is one potent apparel. Shuzenji commented. Izuku hummed in agreement. Jimina-san delivered it together with another device. Aizawa-sensei has it. His voice was dry, the vampire very clear with his displeasure. The elder heroine didn't find it in herself to joke about the topic, even if to lighten up the mood. Have you displayed any other side effects from it? It is common for these devices to have a few flaws and cause discomfort. Recovery girl tried to be as caring as possible with her questions, trying to avoid setting off any landmines. Izuka took a deep breath, releasing it in a slow beat. Truthfully, nothing so far. I can feel the suppressive radiation, but it is not as strong as it could be. It irks me, but so far it hasn't truly impeded me with any of my affairs. Truth be told, Izuku could barely feel it. It was quite scary how easy it felt to get used to the suppressive device, though the beast within, within, did an excellent job of remembering its existence. He hadn't yet acted in a way that warranted the HSBC to use the device's full power, which meant that he had yet to experience it as such, but it always paid to be prepared in advance as much as one could do so. Recovery girl checked something on the computer on her desk. I'll request the necessary recommendations from Aizawa, just in case we need to stock up on something. We haven't had the need to deal with such a situation before, you know. The nurse complained a bit, but Izuku could sense that it wasn't towards him and more towards the situation itself. Thank you, and sorry causing trouble to you. He grunted, finished with tidying up his school uniform. While it was a school day, there would be no heroic training after classes, a rare empty time slot available for the students. Izuku originally didn't have plans, but then he remembered the invitation from Mandalay, aka Sosaki Shino. There had been some time since he last saw Koda, and it would be nice to stretch his legs away from UA and his responsibilities for a few hours. Also, May and Melissa were busy with their own projects and coursework, so that left Izuka with a rare free time slot. Nonsense, Sunny. It is a grown-up's job to worry about these things. Children should be allowed to frolic and enjoy their youth. Izuku scoffed at those words. 
that earned him a side glance from the elder nurse, but he let the heat of her gaze wash off his back. He was just about to exit the infirmary when the nurse called him out. Is that all, Sonny? Shizenji's question made Izuku remain by the sliding door for a few moments. He then opened the door and exited the room. I'm all right. His reply was drowned down as the door closed, leaving him alone in the corridors of UA. It might be nothing serious, so the vampire kept it to himself. The usual thrumming of power that ran inside his veins had become quite strong, so strong that it kept be begging to be released, so strong it claimed for more of itself. It wanted to gorge its thirst, the desire something he was quite familiar with, though it certainly felt raw this time around. Almost as if all-encompassing. Even at its most rebellious state, True Ancestor always obeyed Izuku and by consequence of this, all his other quirk factors acquired through blood bowed down to his will. Yet not a few weeks ago he had been having stronger urges. The timing matched his resurrection by blood. He wasn't about to go out of control and cause some slaughter, but his natural urges seemed to become thoroughly amplified. His battle lust, his thirst, and even, he was a bit ashamed to admit, his sexual urges. He caught himself staring at some of his female classmates far longer than needed, though as luck would have it, he had yet to be caught. However, the vampire was aware that it would only be a matter of time for such to happen. The suppression imposed on him only seemed to further exacerbate his condition. He had two girlfriends, wasn't that a statement, and yet here he was, lusting for more. The vampire hoped that his outing with Mandalay and Kota eased his mind from these troubles. Izuku sighed. Just short of a year ago he lived mostly alone with his mother, already used to being ostracized due to his appearance in Quirk. However, before he even knew how, the vampire found himself surrounded by people that cared about him. It was eye-widening in an awe-inducing manner. He was used solely with the warmth of his mother. Now he had the embrace of May and Melissa. The support of his classmates and teachers. The vampire now had many things. And that was something that he would protect with razor-sharp claws and fangs. Fangs. He would rip and tear into anyone that might try to take that away from him. He clenched his right hand, feeling not only the rivers of life coursing through his veins, but also the collective power of, one for all, and even the troublesome spark of, all for one. Your arm is all glowing and stuff, is that okay? A female voice spoke by his side, Izuku only now managing to sense her presence. Said female presence belonged to the girl that was squatting by his side, her cerulean blue eyes fully focused on the sparks that had been popping off from his limb. Nijayar-san, right? Izuka tried to make sure he wasn't disrespectful to his senpai, wondering how the girl had managed to get so close without him being aware of her. Had he entered such a deep mind dive right there in the corridor? Those would be questions for later. For now, he stopped pulling on the quirk factors, the glow vanishing from his arm. Ah, the glow is gone. The girl seemed very disappointed that the small light show was over. Her eyes shifted from his arm to Izuku's pupils, the girl only now realizing he had spoken back to her. Yep, that's me, Nijayar Chan. She popped her words, energetically standing from her squatting position and bouncing up. She patted down the back of her skirt and kept her arms backwards, circling and examining the vampire with her wide, curious eyes. Izuku wasn't used to being the target of such eyes, so it made him feel a bit self-conscious. That was part of your vampire powers, right? How does that work? Does your blood fuel it? Can you become an engine? Are you planning on becoming UA's Dark Lord or something? Is blood tasty? How would my blood taste? How would your blood taste? Nijayar began spitting out questions, almost overwhelming Izuku with their frequency. Frequency. He checked his wristwatch, wondering why Nijayar was here instead of having a meal. All the while the girl kept launching questions at him. She was intense, that's for sure. Izuku held his hands up in an effort to slow the girl's mouth down. He was successful, as she did quiet down, though her following action wasn't helpful to him at all. She leaned forward, her heavy chest following gravity and becoming attention-grabbing, she stared at him with bright and innocent eyes, her body emanating a savory scent that made Izuka's mouth fill with saliva. 
clenching his maw, Izuku took advantage of the girl's momentary silence to recompose himself. I'm glad my quirk inspires this much curiosity in you, Nijayar-san, but I don't think we have the time for me to satisfy your questions. He replied in a tentative manner, hoping that his reasonable excuse worked to ward off the girl. It wasn't all an excuse, as the intricacies of his power did require a bit of time to fully explain. Not to insult the girl's intelligence, but it did seem that she would not sit still for the necessary time it would take for him to explain his power. Thankfully, Nijaya returned to a proper standing pose. Izuku's eyes did linger for a second too long on her bountiful chest, but he corrected his gaze. It didn't help much, as the girl pouted, her plump lips moist and attention calling. You are totally looking at me as if I can't focus, right? Nijaya's complaint was followed by another cute pout of her lips. The vampire pierced his own hands with his claws, the small pain enough to focus his efforts away from sexuality. He really was in need of a proper workout, even if the device around his neck would likely make that di difficult. Everyone in class also thinks the same, it is so frustrating. She followed with her complaints. Izuku wondered what to say to the bubbly girl. Should he try to soothe her ego? Before there was a need, Izuku sensed a vibration coming from Nijire. She stopped her spin and began patting her school's coat, likely trying to find her phone. After a few moments, she seemed to remember the device's location. Rather unashamedly, Nijire unbuttoned her coat's first buttons and stuffed her hand inside her chest and pulled her phone from it. Traces of a sweet scent wafted up to him, though Izuku clenched his jaw to aid him in his efforts to focus. A muted laughter echoed in his mind, along with a female's giggling. He tightened his hold on his mind's palace, suppressing the troublesome duo. Nijire finished typing a response to whatever message she received, and then returned her phone to her chest pocket. Sorry about that, my friends were wondering why I was taking so long. Izuku shook his head. There is no need to apologize. Thanks for being so comprehensive. Nijire let a smile blossom on her lips. Do you mind if we exchange contacts? You didn't answer my questions after all. The girl wiggled a finger in front of the vampire's face. He resisted the urge to point out that she had already stored away her phone inside her special pocket. Instead, the vampire nodded. It seemed that Aizawa-sensei would organize a few more mock fights between 1A and 1B against 3A, so they would have more opportunities to do so. That is, if the girl didn't forget about it in their next encounter. Nijire let another bright smile split her lips. Then, I'll talk to you another time, Izuku-kun. She left, skipping her steps and carrying her bubbly energy along, the vampire letting his own lips quirk up at the girl's behavior. And again, his eyes followed the girl's derriere as she went down the hallway. You know, I'm betting that she wants you to hit it, hit it. Her scent is most pleasing. It would not be bad to have a taste. I could do without your extra commentary. He spoke aloud, brushing a hand over his face. And then he noticed that he was pitching a tent. Izuku almost snarled at himself. Sosaki Shino's POV. 15.23 p.m. Shibuya's train station. Shino brushed a lock of hair behind her ear, one hand firmly holding Koda's hand. Her young charge's anxiousness was apparent, the child tapping his shoes against the pavement in a clear display of impatience. Though soon enough Koda's incessant tapping stopped, the child almost rushing away from her hold. A small tug and he stopped pulling on her hand, patiently waiting for the vampire's arrival. Izuku slowly walked upstairs from the underground metro station. His gait was confident, the sharp look in his eyes rather unmistakable from the common civilians around him. Shino smiled and waved at the teen, his gaze long focused on them as soon as he emerged from the underground pass. He reached them, allowing Shino to take in his outfit. He wasn't dressed in anything overly fancy, black sneakers, dark blue jeans, a red inner shirt, and an open black jacket. Though Shino had to question the large oval glasses, it did look good on him, especially with his hair grown like it was, but she knew that he didn't need them. A proper look revealed that they were merely aesthetic, further stoking her curiosity about the item. It was the later parts of October, and the climate was getting colder, so Shino was in something warm. 
Her sweater was a creamy beige piece with long sleeves, her dark red skirt covering her legs too. She hadn't done anything special to her hair either, though looking at Izuku's appearance she felt like she should have dolled up a bit more. A moment later, Shino kicked herself mentally for the thought. Hello there, Shino-san, Kodakun. The vampire, vampire greeted them in his usual way, squatting down to properly meet her nephew's gaze. How have you been behaving? He asked Koda, seeing the young child almost glow at being under Izuku's gaze. I've been behaving. I'm studying properly, doing my homework, and haven't troubled Auntie or any of the pussycats. Koda rapidly replied to the vampire's question, gazing up to Shino so that she could compound on his story. She couldn't help but chuckle. That's true, we haven't had any more troubles so far. Koda has been a model student these days. Izuku hummed in a pleased tune, standing up from his squatting position. He took Koda's hat off in a smooth motion, running one hand over his hair and messing with him. That's good. He returned Koda's hat, the young boy blushing a bit and glancing at the side, away from Izuku, though Koda seemed to be glowing due to Izuku's praise of him. You shouldn't trouble your relatives. I know, I know. I changed, right, auntie? Koda turned his head to his aunt, eyes hoping for her to follow through. Yes, you did. Mandalay confirmed the statement, letting her features soften into a serene expression. She then turned her gaze towards Izuku. Shall we head out? Izuku nodded, heading to Koda's side. Anything in special you want to do, Koda Kuan? The child almost immediately latched to Izuku's side, one of his hands raised towards the vampire's own limb. Seeing as Izuku's hand was larger than Koda's, the boy held on the vampire's first two digits, his other hand aiming for Shino's hand. She happily obliged, grasping the hand as Koda happily shared his thoughts. Yeah. Koda firmly grasped the duo's hands, rushing ahead and pulling them towards a specific direction. There is this new arcade place that opened and my friends at school were talking about it. Koda displayed great enthusiasm as he brought the duo, duo with him in his rush to reach the game arcade as soon as possible. They had to walk a bit from the station to the commercial area, but soon enough the trio reached it. The streets were fairly busy, though nothing that created trouble for them. Izuku's choice of letting his hair grow allowed him a degree of furtiveness. And the glasses were just a touch more to aid in his endeavor of having a peaceful outing without being accosted or recognized by people. He still sent Aizawa Sensei a message to report about his date with Shino, more out of respect than true need, but it was no longer truly necessary as the government now had his constant location due to the yes.h.a.c.k.l.e.s, constantly broadcasting it. He opted to not let the circumstance bother him for now. It wouldn't do to sour Koda's day with his own personal affairs after all. The arcade was what one would expect from such a place. Many consoles and machines played music in an effort to attract customers, the atmosphere festive and enjoyable, it was honestly Izuku's first time in such a place, as before he had never received an invitation or had a reason to be at a place like this before. Koda's eyes glimmered with the light show from the many machines around him, the child barely able to contain his excitement at the experience. He released the hands of his guardians and spun around in place, practically vibrating in front of the duo. Can we please play already? I want to try that one. Koda pointed towards one of the machines, it being a console with two toy guns attached with cords and a large screen. It was a zombie FPS, the title Biohazard in toxic green letters and plastic faux gore atop the machine. Izuku chuckled. Sure, lead the way. The vampire turned his head to Shino, seeing the mature lady nod her head along with him. Go on you too. I'll see if they have something for us to snack on. Shino stated. Koda ha had already rushed to guard their turn on the machine, firmly grasping one of the toy guns and constantly turning around to see if Izuku was ready. Before Shino could head out, Izuku tapped her on her shoulder. She turned and waited for him. The teen, much to her surprise, pulled his wallet from his jacket and opened it, pulling out a 10.000 yen bill and handing it to her. I'll cover it today. Let Kota Kuan have his fun. Shino was stunned into an action, Izuku having already left to approach Kota before she could react. 
She was a bit miffed, wondering if the young teen thought that she unable to cover for her nephew's day out. Sure, the bills of the wild, wild pussycats had been expensive the last month due to the medical expenses, but Sasaki was still very much able to pay for some snacks and a few games for Koda. Still, it was a nice act. Koda had cleaned up his act ever since the events from the summer training camp and Izuku had been the one to break through the shell that her nephew had put up. The Himamancer got Koda's trust and hope in heroes back. Shino sighed, pushing the swirling mass of thoughts in her head to a corner and deciding to deal with that later. She was the adult here, she ought to behave like one. She quickly headed to a corner of the arcade and got the two some drinks and a few snacks. As she was returning to meet with them, Shino had a direct line of vision of Koda by Izuku's side, the wide smile that her kid nephew displayed as he played was a dearly missed and a sight for sore eyes. Innocent joy, something that the child had not displayed ever since his parents' demise now returned to his eyes. Sosaki bit the corner of her lower lip, ignoring the mental image of her fellow team member Ryuko and her inappropriate commentary about young bucks. Later that evening, 21.37 p.m. Shibuya, Arcade Store Izuku and Shino left the arcade store they had been at for the past few hours, the vampire care carefully holding a sleeping Koda on his chest while he carried a bag full of prizes and plushies they, I.E., Izuku had done the heavy lifting, gained, especially those acquired on the claw machine. The duo walked side by side on the less occupied part of the streets, the evening bringing about a different type of life to the streets of Shibuya. For those that looked over the trio, the impression they had was that of a family enjoying a night outing. It took a few more moments, but the woman at his side called his attention. You know, he looks up to you. Shino spoke in a low tone, her steps light and whimsical. Is that so? Izuku murmured, adjusting his one-handed hold so that Koda didn't slip off. I'm nothing special. Just a wee bit scary. He played it cool at the end, chuckling at some internal joke. Shino walked a few steps ahead of the vampire, turning to face him. Don't be so gloomy, Midori Yukuan. The mature woman pointed out, walking backwards as she continued facing him. I have seen that devious smile you sometimes show when you get excited. Just keep using that one. Izuku was a bit stunned. He was quite sure that his poker face had been constant during his training with the pussycats, but with Mandalay's words he knew he was caught lacking. Feeling amusement, the vampire's lips quirked unconsciously at Shino's words. Suddenly the woman got close, her finger pointing to Midoriya's face, the digit almost touching his nose. Yes, that one. Though at this point it would be useless to hide his expressions, Izuku immediately controlled his face muscles and schooled his expressions. Shino stopped her backwards walk, forcing Izuku to do the same, lest he run into her. Koda shifted a bit on his arms, but remained peacefully sleeping, his hands clutching at Izuku's jacket. Come on, we already had this talk. You don't need to hide like that with me. This was for relaxation, you can't relax like that. Sasaki's tone was gentle and motherly, in a way that reminded Izuku of his own mother. He couldn't help but relax and take a deep breath, slowly filling his lungs with air and Shino's homely scent. Izuku wanted to appreciate it, but he took in consideration their location. With a quick exhale, Izuku let his tight expression loosen up. Shino and Koda still had to take the train to return home, and he himself had to return to UA. There was a curfew time after all, and Izuku was skirting it close with his time. He tapped Koda's back stirring the child away from his nap. Koda grumbled, but eventually he woke up, wiping the drool that accumulated on the corner of his mouth. Once Koda noticed that Izuku had been carrying him in his sleep, the child blushed in shame at being treated like this. He did try to disengage from Izuku's hold, the vampire aiding in putting the young boy back on the floor. Koda looked at the floor in shame, but eventually he raised his gaze back to match the vampire's eyes. I wasn't asleep. Just a bit tired, so I closed my eyes to rest a bit. Koda exclaimed in a burst of embarrassed noise, hoping to not be seen as a mere brat by the vampire. Izuku and Shino chuckled together. Of course not, Koda Kuan. You are a big boy after all. Izuku spoke in his best soothing voice, the sound deep and low in tune. I need to get going now, 
but we can meet again another time. Shino-san has my number, so feel free to message me anytime you want. The vampire stated, pushing the bag with the plushies and prizes to Koda. Koda grumbled, but took the offered bag from the green-haired teen's hand and held it to his chest almost as if it was a sacred treasure. The child's eyes betrayed his feelings, the young boy clearly unwilling to part away from Izuku, yet understanding that they had their fill of fun for the day. I'll work, work hard on my studies and go to UA in the future. I don't know if I want to be a hero, but I want to study in the same place you did. Koda declared to the vampire, his eyes shimmering with raw emotion. I see. I hope to see your best efforts then, Koda Kuen. Izuku approached Koda and took the child's hat off once more, carefully running his clawed hands over his black hair. I'll be watching and waiting for you. As he finished speaking, Izuku turned to face Mandalay. Feel free to text me or call me if there is anything that you need. The vampiric teen had spent much of the afternoon along with Koda, so conversations with Shino had remained mostly to common banter. He wanted to check in on the rest of the pussycats, but it would feel callous to start talking serious like that and leave Koda aside. Besides, he could text with her later. The woman looked at him with a curious gaze, her brown eyes scanning over his face for any traces of falsehood. Sensing none, Sasaki released a small breath. You are really serious about this, huh? A small smile blossomed on her lips. Izuku nodded. Koda silently looked over the interaction. He wondered if he should say anything, but he had promised to behave and be a good child. The vampire looked at his phone, checking the time. Come on, it's getting late. I'll walk you both to the station. The aunt and nephew looked at each other, the child's face switching through a few emotions as they seemed to have some sort of silent one-way conversation. Considering Shino's quirk, that was a very real possibility. Though it didn't bother Izuku, he couldn't help but be a bit curious as to what the heroine was talking about. You do know that I'm right here. He pushed the thought towards Mandalay through blood resonance. The little flinch she did was confirmation enough, a small smirk painting Iz Izuku's lips. She jokingly rolled her eyes, grasping Koda's hand. Come on then, Mr. Vampire. We need a proper escort after all. Your mission isn't done just yet. She teased back in a good-natured tone. Izuku answered in kind, letting his smile remain while he adjusted his faux glasses in place. He needed to finish his escort mission after all, and it would be nice to remain with Koda and Shino for a while longer before he had to return to his dorm room. The next few days went by at a rapid pace, the vampire and his classmates feeling prepared to face the incoming challenge of the provisional license exam. The majority of the heroics classes had moved into the dorm too, which made it become a rather full house. The two sister classes did help one another as more and more rooms came up to be filled. Thankfully most of Azuku's new tenants, technically the building was under his responsibility after all, could properly look after themselves, but of course being teenagers, a few slip-ups did happen once in a while. Nothing major so far had happened, but then again it hadn't been long since the two classes moved in together. So far, the only trouble that had happened was when dealing with bath time scheduling. Nothing that wasn't rapidly fixed by the ever-so-serious Ida and the attentive Yayorozu. Though it was nice to be among classmates and colleagues, it was a bit of a personal challenge getting used to living with so many new people. Izuku was used to having the dormitory to himself before, and now he had to share the living space with plenty of people. That brought plenty of intricacies that he wasn't used to, especially considering the lack of proper division between the classes and female to male rooms. There weren't exactly properly laid rules too, which sometimes caused some confusion. There was an incident with Kaminari eating Momo's wagyu steaks, which left the rich heiress in a down mood. Ida scolded the blonde, blonde which led to Katsuki shouting at the two for being a disturbance to the peace, which then led to Monoma shouting at him, which led to Kendo getting involved in from there on it was basically a chaotic mess for a good hour or two. One time someone mistakenly swapped the common coffee with some of Reiko Sans, from Class 1B, special Brazilian blend, and everyone looked like crackheads for the better part of a day. Kyuka constantly looked grumpy, though when asked the reasons, she would merely huff and puff. 
Izuku ended up having more luck getting the info out of her, which ended up being just Mina and Toru being giggling schoolgirls in their rooms late into the night and keeping the punk rocker up with their nonsense. Though Izuku figured that Jairu wasn't exactly innocent either in this equation, as when he offered to talk with the girls, he received the cold shoulder treatment as well as a bunch of eye rolls from the punk girl. All in all, it was a nice and interesting experience. Now though, the day called for a more serious stance. Today, they would be heading towards Shinjuku to take the license exam. The day started early on, as usual, for the vampire. He woke up long before the sun could rise, checking on Nananumu's state and transferring some of his blood to the bioengineered body. That being done, he headed to the roof for a light practice session. There wasn't anything more to prepare for the license exam outside of what they had already been doing, so Izuku opted to merely loosen his muscles. After a short hour of light exercises, Izuku was ready to shower and get into his uniform. Breakfast was a quiet affair to him, as it was still quite early in the day for most of everyone in the dormitory. It was close to daybreak when the first of his classmates began to show up, Ida and Kendo showing their dedication to getting some light exercises before the exam, much like how the, how the vampire had done. The speedster talked a bit, but was soon out for his usual morning jog, while the martial artist lingered by the kitchen counter, seemingly chewing on some thoughts. Izuko found amusing that Kendo thought herself to be discreet, her eyes would ever so often settle upon his frame, the vampire completely aware of her gaze. Izuku stood from his seat and approached the orange-haired girl. Would you like me to get you anything, Kendo-san? He politely asked, already reaching the stove and letting his shadow tendrils stretch towards the fridge. Kendo seemed startled with his call-out, the small panicky movements of her hands being a cute little tick he had observed usually happened when she was nervous or caught off guard like this. It was quick though. I wouldn't want to impose, Izuku-kun. Her response was met with a scoff from the vampire, the green-haired teen already working on a frying some eggs. Nonsense. He replied, turning around to match her line of sight, shadowy tendrils working on the cooking with proficiency. It's just a few eggs. Physically active heroes such as Kendo burn through calories like crazy, so having hearty meals was a must for them. They couldn't live off blood like him. The girl took a seat and leaned on the counter, stretching her back and suppressing a noise from her mouth. Hmm, then I'll mooch off your kindness for today. The martial artist joked, her eyes resting over the vampire's back. You are quite the cook, Izukukuan. I wouldn't expect that from you. Kendo suddenly commented. The vampire hummed a curious tone. Is that so? He put some bread to toast, already separating the necessarily plates for Kendo's meal. Itsuka nodded. Well, yeah. I mean, most of the guys in class couldn't cook anything worth to save, to save their lives. Making instant ramen or heating up leftovers doesn't count as cooking. She pointed out. Though now that I think about it, you did make a dish with Komori back during the training camp. Where did you learn cooking? Izuku finished with the girl's simple meal and put it on toast, fixing a quick and easy breakfast. My mother taught me. Taking in consideration my strange sleeping hours, it was much better having me learn how to make my own meals than imposing on her at the crack of dawn or the middle of the night. He also placed a mug with warm coffee nearby. Kendo clapped her hands in a prayer. Itadokimasu. She then took a bite, the following noise that left her mouth singing praise to the simple dish. The girl then quickly munched away the presented meal. Once she noticed Izuku looking over her, Kendo blushed a bit and looked at the side. What? It was good. She hid her expressions while sipping on the mug. Izuku let a small smile paint his lips as he took her plate away to quickly wash it. Kendo was quick to follow him to the sink, leaning on the counter close to the vampire as he worked on the plate and frying pan. So, how are you feeling about the license exam? The Himamancer shrugged his shoulders. Aizawa-sensei prepared us for it, so now it's hard work on our side. What a non-answer. Kendo rolled her eyes and showed him her tongue in a childish manner. You know what I mean. Izuku did not, in fact, know what she meant by that. Seeing his lack of response, Kendo stared hard the vampire, making so that he matched her gaze. 
green emerald orbs met sapphire blues, not a hint of nervousness behind the placid gaze of the hemomancer. The martial artist bit her lower lip, trying to phrase out something coherent, but failing the task as she tried to glean anything of use from the vampire's expression. Why you are not even a little bit nervous or anxious, anxious, or anything like that? Though she stuttered a bit at the beginning, Kendo managed to ask her question. Izuku's immediate answer was a bit of a shock. Not really. How come? She asked in a hurry, though in hindsight the answer should be obvious. Wana wasn't called the wonder class of UA for nothing after all. To even further emphasize that point, Izuku had been the one in the spotlight for quite a while, being a prominent fighter against the first villain invasion against UA, becoming the champion of the school festival, being able to subjugate the hero killer stain, then being victim of a kidnapping and many more. Less than a full school year had gone by, and Kendo could say without a shadow of a doubt that Izuku was going to be a pro hero. Controversies aside, his drive and dedication could seldom be matched. And those that did match his drive for success were also in his class, continuously pushing him to become even better. Heck, even Kendo herself was an apprentice under his tutelage, as it was due to him that she had finally managed to properly execute one of her family's secret moves. He reminded her too much of her grandfather, the person who had inspired her to become a hero. Izuku closed his eyes for a moment, seemingly deep into thought. Kendo leaned a bit towards him, eager to learn whatever secret he had to share. He then lightly flickered her nose, his expression being one of pure amusement as he opened his eyes. You will need to figure that on your own, Miss Flashstep. Kendo blinked oldishly, left stunned for a second. She then tried to place him in a headlock, her competitiveness stirred by his foolish act. His resistance against her was token at best, letting the girl grind a knuckle against the top of his head. Why, you? There was a snort from him, followed by a quick motion that swept her off her feet, the vampire effortlessly carrying the martial art artist on his arms as she tried her best to inconvenience him. Mr. Calm and Collected Vampire. How about you show some emotion like us mortals, huh? It took a joke along, any previous tension forgotten as she fooled around with Izuku. While the two teenagers joked and fooled about in the early hours of the day, from the corner of the stairs a figure stared hard at them. Brunette, with a bob cut and lightly chubby figure, Yurarika's eyes displayed very little emotion as she looked over the two from a distance. Eventually the morning properly came and with it the usual responsibilities of the hero trainees. Taking the bus provided by UA early, the heroics classes were directed to the large stadium in which the first part of the exam would be taken. Aizawa supervised the two first-year classes and let them head to the changing lockers without much fanfare. He wasn't one for speeches after all, and he and his fellow teachers made sure to drill in their heads everything that the youngsters needed to know. Now it was solely on them to acquire their early license. He headed to observational stands, aware of the troublesome woman that had been eyeing him ever since he stepped a foot near the gigantic arena. Aizawa released a frustrated sigh, crossing his arms and trying to not get preemptively annoyed at her foolish antics. He failed terribly. What is it, woman? He was curt and dry, hoping that his sour, he very much knew about it, attitude would get the heroine to take the hint. Oh you wound my heart, eraser. Does it pain you to smile? Said Heroin theatrically faked a hurt expression, though soon she sat by his side. Are you worried about your little ones? Last year you didn't bring any after all, now you are here with them. Did you finally decide to be less grumpy? Would you consider signing this now? She barraged the man with questions, lastly offering a paper and pen to him. Aizawa took another deep breath, releasing an annoyed sigh. It was one-time joke, move on. He stated, cutting her off, off. The now-named joke animatedly clutched at her chest in a broken-hearted manner. Ugh, rejected again. It is not kind to reject a woman's invitation, how rude of you. You are the rude one, trying to get me to marry you. Another exaggerated motion from joke, the heroine still smiling through the conversation, and she stopped with the antics. Fixing her bandana in place, the heroine looked over the arena grounds, her jovial expression remaining in place, though the smile didn't reach her eyes. Seriously, this time. 
It is rare to see you personally coming off to see a class perform. Most of the time I see ectoplasma or can, not you. Aizawa remains silent for a few moments, likely cycling through his thoughts. Then, he uncrossed his arms and spoke. This year is different, no doubt about it. I'm just following through with my work, hoping to see their potential realized. Joke had a file by her side. She opened it and checked a few pages, then she pulled a particular one, the profile photo attached on the corner making the underground hero tighten his eyes marginally. These were forwarded to us by the HSPC. You have a full roster of impressive names here. You betting on anyone in particular? Joke let some humor into her last question, but it was clear that she was fishing for more information on his class. He shrugged his shoulders, letting his lazy expressions betray nothing. The heroine whined. Come on, eraser. We are pals, right? Good buddy old pals. You could share it with me, you know. I'll even let you hit it. She placed her right thumb between her pointer and middle finger. Aizawa dully blinked at her. That's sexual harassment. Joke puffed her chest out, trying to maintain her high spirit. It's okay if a woman says it. Between you and Midnight, which one will get locked up first? The underground hero shot Joke down again. Gah! You are relentless today. She deflated, deflated a bit. Though soon she was back in full force. If you marry me today, then I can share my class's files with you. You will still have time to relay it to your class. Eraser head facepalmed, slowly dragging his hands over his face. Joke then leaned against his shoulder in a half hug, pressing her body against his. So, is that a, yes? She tiptoed two fingers across his chest and close to his jaw, but a quick move from the black-clad hero had the woman tightly bound by his capture scarf. Oh, kinky. We are going straight to bondage a HMPGH. Whatever else she had to say was impeded as the weapon was used to close her mouth. Letting the woman remain bound by his side, Aizawa returned his gaze to the arena. I didn't tell them about UA's culling, if that's what you were asking. He told her in his usual deadpan tone, the woman widening her eyes at the revealed information. A bit of wiggling and a light release on his part, and Joke managed to get the binding loose enough to allow her mouth freedom. Are you serious? Isn't that, like, super cruel on your part? All the other schools won't hesitate to pair up to eliminate your class, mine included. Aizawa scoffed. Heh, that's fine. It was rare to see, but Joke wished her hands had been free so that she could have recorded or taken a picture of his current face. He was still the same disheveled, exhausted-looking mess of a workaholic, but that expression was million in one. A proud face. Please, marry me. Joke exclaimed, trying her best to show a lovey-dovey expression to Aizawa. All that was reflected in his eyes was disgust at her creepy smiling expression and lustful eyes. I refuse. Ah, your rejection hurts so good. But s seriously now, are you sure they will be okay? Joke was unbound, her face now sporting a serious visage. Aizawa nodded. It is merely another obstacle for them to overcome. Sink or swim, huh? Joke mused loudly, supporting her face with her open palms, elbows resting on her thighs. I skimmed through your class's files, UA brought heavy hitters this year. This Bakugo kid was a war machine during UA's festival and Endeavor's son was overwhelming, but especially that Midoriya kid that won first place. Rumor around the block is that your brats have enough power to be besting even A-class heroes. Aizawa hummed a sound that echoed between agreement and indifference. Joke remained silent for a while, letting tension build between the two of them. Be honest with me, Shota. She then spoke in a serious tone, no traces of joking remaining. What are we going to be seeing here? The male homeroom teacher let the silence remain between the two of them once more, his black eyes closing alone. Joke almost gave up on a reply from the man, however, he suddenly spoke again. Culling, group effort, jumping, call it whatever, he began, 
fixating his eyes on his students as they emerged from their design locker in their uniforms. When the chips are down, anything goes. I have trained them to expect the unexpected. They don't need preemptive warnings or any mollycoddling, they are UA students, they shall overcome it. Were anyone else speaking those words, Joke would have laughed on their faces without even the need to use her quirk, as the joke was already done. However, they came out of Aizawa Shota. Joke properly fixed her sitting position, her eyes following along the students. Being a pro hero was much more than just a title and a paycheck. Situational awareness and excellent judgment were necessary if one wanted to be considered a pro. Pro. She would wait and see, after all boasting was well and good, but unless it was backed by actual skill, it was simply grandstanding. Besides, could one or two classes really withstand the other 15 schools that would be gunning for them and hunting them down? There were about 500 students participating in the provisional license exam, but only 100 spots available after all. UA was known for being top tier, but would they really snatch that large of a victory over the schools? Are you sure you don't want to marry me? I have the documents right here, we could be done in consummating it before the kiddos are finished. God fucking damn it. Shinjuku Grand Stadium, Provisional Heroic Exam Site, 9.45 AM. Izuku calmly placed the last of the electronic weak points that everyone had been handed by the attendance of the HSPC, eyeing his classmates also finish with the last of their preparations. The vampire remained quiet, cycling through his available weaponry for the exam. There were some instructions given before as they entered the stadium. This year's exam would supposedly consist of a type of battle royale, each trainee having three lives worth of points and to pass you would need to defeat two other people by hitting their last weak point. It felt a bit convoluted as an exam, but then again it was a hard and exclusive promotion that would allow one to greatly stand out from the common heroic student. An early license meant a head start on their careers after all, so all were gunning for the available spots. Izuku also checked out the handballs that they were given, tossing one of the six up and down a few times to get a few for the throwables. As the time for, th for them to change ran out, all the vampire's classmates, along with a few unfamiliar faces from other schools, were brought to a rather cramped and dark room and told to wait for the buzzer that would indicate the start of the exam. Izuku could perfectly see that the walls here were thin and modular, the vampire also easily spotting his classmates. He approached Tokoyami, sensing the power brimming within, dark shadow. It was one of the nifty features granted to him by the, all for one shackles, quirk factor, the ability to sense the activation of quirks around him. The vampire touched his friend's shoulder, seeing the raven-headed teen snap his gaze towards him in a hurry, only to release a decompressing and relieved sigh. You had me scared for a moment, fellow abyss dweller. The bird-headed teen spoke in his usual dramatic flair. Izuku let the corner of his lips twirl upwards. It would be better to focus on other things, such as the eyes of our opponents. He stated, discreetly pointing with his head to his back. Tokoyami might not have the dark sight that the vampire had, but he nodded alone. I sensed it too while we were being brought here. Many eyes are upon us, their dark gaze fully enchanted with odious and caustic intent. They intend to drag us to the bottom of a pit, should we allow it to happen? Izuku raised a brow at his friend's little speech. Tokoyami was generally a quiet person, so for him to be speaking this much unprompted meant that he was rather nervous about this exam. The vampire hummed along, allowing the literal bird-headed teen to continue his spiel for a little longer. Tension seemed to grow each second that the many teenagers remained in the room, their hunger for victory almost palpable in the air. Izuku embraced the tension with open arms, the myriad of murmurs and shifting clothes dying down to a symphony of many songs as the vampire focused on the inner noise that their, their bodies caused. Many heartbeats, many songs playing their various sets. From erratic noises, to growing crescendos, to placid sonatas, each uniquely distinct, yet similar enough for him to decode. Sight meant nothing for Izuku at this moment, as even if he closed his eyes, he could see all the 165 hearts that thumped here. Suddenly a microphone noise gathered the attention of everyone, hidden speakers crackling to life. Itua, I hope that you all prepared well enough. A bored voice echoed from the speakers, the man speaking seemingly unconcerned with the students' moods. For those wondering, I'm Yukomaru Mara, 
the acting head of the HSPC and one of the many proctors that will be judging your skills in the provisional exam. The man sounded as unenthusiastic as one could be, but that was not the major focus of the vampire. This man self-declared himself to be the acting head of the HPSC. There was a growling echoing inside Izuku's head, the vampire focusing on maintaining a calm grip on his emotions. It wouldn't do to lose his cool now, even with one of the agents of his troubles right in front of him. As the man himself spoke, he was merely an acting head for the government branch, a fancy titled office worker. Though it was also good that man had decided to deliver his speech remotely instead of explaining it in person. No sense in getting heated now, tiger. Nana's thoughts swam to the surface of his mind, along with a ghostly caress on his shoulders in a calming manner. You can get your get back later, for now the important thing is passing this exam. Don't give them a reason to tighten their grip on your collar. There was a second, fiercer growling that echoed within the confines of Izuku's head. These shackles. We shall see whose chains are stronger. Our answer lies in blood, master. B W O O O O O O O O O O O O O O O. A blaring air horn loudly echoed within the confines of the walls of the room. Sud suddenly, those same walls released a hiss of air, some hidden locking mechanisms disengaging and releasing their hold on each other, allowing the walls to quickly fall backwards and reveal the larger field that they had been placed at. There were a few other environments in their sight, the specific region that Izuku and his classmates were at a mountain-like zone. Heh, I luck out with these. Izuku remembered the times in which he found himself challenged in mountainous areas. The vampire then noticed that the electronic weak points he placed on himself, one on his right shoulder, one on his right chest and one lower in his left flank, lit up. The exam starts now. With all the enthusiasm of a dying crow, Mara announced the start of the provisional exam. Izuku immediately took a defensive stance, noticing the hostility from most of the people surrounding him and his classmates. The mishmash of students remained still for a moment. However, like a crack in a dam, the first handball flew towards them in an arc. It failed at properly reaching anyone in particular, but the moment the ball stopped bouncing on the earth floor, all hell broke loose. Aura. Target UA. Get those bastards. That spot is mine. Akin to a swarm of insects, a myriad of handballs were tossed around, particularly towards the UA group of 1A, their sister class being in another zone, though by the look of things they were being no less targeted than Izuku and his classmates. Not only that, but countless other attacks were launched towards the group, their intent on crushing the 19 teens here rather apparent. Hisatsu, ultimate move. Dark Shadow. Two voices were whispered among the cacophony of shouts, though it was certain that the two Dark Lords of Wana weren't the sole ones performing some sort of technique. From a secluded area on the stands, Yukomaru Mara observed through various screens the, the beginning stage of the provisional exam. He rubbed his tired eyelids, muting the mic that was secured to the right side of his face. This year the provisional exams were a bit special, though not for exactly good reasons. Mara suppressed a yawn, trying his best to push past the tiredness that was organizing this rushed exam. The work had been pushed on his back as the acting figurehead, and though he took pride in trying to nurture a good relationship between the public and their future civil servants, I.E., the heroes, tiresome work was tiresome work. The forced retirement of All Might, the chaos caused by All for One's emergence, these events completely changed the paradigm of Japan's hero-centric society and shook the core beliefs of its citizens. The HSPC was doing its very best to promote the image of the remaining heroes as well as push out a new generation to inspire the populace, but that was no cakewalk. There was also another element mixed in there that made things exponentially troublesome, Midoriya Izuku. His quirk was an anomaly the likes of which could only be seen once in a century. Coming from the cream of the crop school that was UA, the vampire was bound to be a central figure in the incoming years, if his track record was to be counted, saying months wasn't even a too high optimistic expectation, and normally he would be a major inspiration for the future. However, the vampire was a wrench in the cogs of the system. To say that his ascension to fame, infamy and truth, was rapid would be an understatement. Izuku simply rocketed to the skies, though not in a glimmering and golden manner. 
The HSBC couldn't exactly chaperone such a killer as he had presented himself to be a pillar like All Might. Yet not everything was lost. The com commission dealt with people after all, and while it was good to have a shining light to gather attention, work in the shadows was also equally as important. They could recruit him, though it had to be on their terms. The vampiric teen's influence had to be called, so that the HSBC could mold him into a usable asset. The government feared what it couldn't control after all, and there were very few people that they couldn't force into obedience. Mara hoped that the vampiric teen would soon cooperate and get into the HSPC's good graces. He would much rather prefer a valuable ally in him and from the reports he had read, Izuku was actually a well-behaved and stable individual. This campaign against him was supposed to be a short one after all, so maybe that's why his superiors were so forceful with their current methods. Last he heard they were going to give him some experimental gear, so maybe Izuku had already made the proper steps towards a better relationship with the higher-ups. Mara could only hope. He looked towards one of the monitors, this one focused on a group mostly composed of students from Shiketsu High, the self-proclaimed rivals of UA. He had mostly skimmed through the files, not really paying attention as he had already enough work on his lap. He hoped that the students finished it already. His current of thoughts stopped in their tracks as he noticed one student flying above the rest while also surrounding himself with the beginnings of a tornado. He linked into the audio, but had to hurriedly cut off the calm as the mics in the area only picked on the roaring winds that circled the teen. A quick search match found the student, Inesa Yarashi from Shiketsu High. He seemed highly enthusiastic in eliminating as many opponents as he could with that whirlwind of his, and soon that was the case as a torrent of the handballs were caught within his quirk and directed towards the other students from opposing schools. Schools. Mind you, you would need to hit the last of three weak spots to secure a kill. Barely five minutes had gone by into the exam, and Inesa was firmly settled atop the scoreboard with 120 eliminations. Mara was stunned into an awakened stupor. He couldn't say anything as he observed the wreck that the wind-controlling team from Shiketsa caused on the field. Though soon he was wrenched from the screen as his eyes caught the sight of the infamous UA crushing that happened every year. The acting head of the HSBC rubbed his tired and dry eyelids again, wondering if his tired and sleep-addled mind was trying to play tricks on him again. He expected the UA students to defend themselves, of course, but what he was seeing made him question the decision of his superiors. The eldritch sight of darkness consuming the field that housed UA's 1A class made Mara wonder if he truly was in the waking world or if he had hallucinated this morning due to overwork. A R U K kidding am me? He managed to stumble out a sentence. If Anesa's score was impressive due to the sheer mass disturbance and disorder that he caused among the opponents, then Izuku's mark was impressively horrid in an entirely different manner. Mara knew that no students were dead, the weak points also acted as health monitors, but their limp bodies hanging from shadowy black-red tendrils almost made him question his own sanity. That all those dark foe limbs spawned from a single source also didn't exactly help matters, as their origin point was the circular pool of darkness that surrounded the vampire in the place of his shadow. It was a grim thing to look at, in the middle of a garden of hanging corpses stood one man. Green-haired and sporting crimson crimson red slitted eyes, he was scanning the area looking for more additions to his macabre field, his hands joined together to make a tiger seal hand sign with each of his fingers sporting additional black and green tinted tendrils. To further add to the somber sight, the many handballs that were tossed towards him were sinking inside some of the running lines of shadow matter on the floor. Another addition to that was the shadow monster by his side, the creature's claws also filled with many handballs, the origin of the shadowy creature being one bird-headed teen whose face was a mask of serious concentration. The mics from that part of the stadium were working just fine, and they picked up on the vampire's words. Hisatsu, Norawarita Korwamori. Ultimate move, Cursed Black Forest. Dark Shadow, Black Hole. The dark duo stood out from the rest due to the sheer display of power, dominating the field with darkness that seemed inescapable. However, while attention calling, the vampire and the bird-headed teen weren't the only ones from Class 1A that were executing their new ultimate moves flawlessly. UA's first-year wonder class decided to start things in a high streak, the majority of the students acting out almost like a well-oiled combat engine. From those with quirks suited for binding and capture, to the surveillance and reconnaissance, to those solely focused on combat, 
the combined effort of the 19 students immediately thwarted and reversed a situation that many others would have been unable to deal with. And at the forefront of these 19 hero trainees, a few stood out as fundamental pieces to keep this machine trucking forward at an unstoppable pace. Yayorozu Yaya Momo stood protected in the middle of her class, the girl's abdomen shining as she began the process of high-speed production of gear. If one were to joke and explain the situation with war terms, the girl would be akin to a arms and munition factory. But Kogo Katsuki quite literally exploded away from the encirclement of the opposing schools against him, aggressively jumping into combat with eagerness unmatched by those around them. Like a shark that sensed blood in the water, Bakugo target his explosions towards targets he perceived as weaker than him in his quest to rip through the competition. Considering his ego, the Ash Blonde marked a great deal of his opponents as piss and weaklings that deserved only to taste defeat in the form of his explosions and his boots between their gums. Todoroki Shoto had yet to act in any grand manner, keeping himself busy with being Momo's fortress as his ice control made for the perfect defense. Anyone that would try to circumvent his cold, defensive walls was met with a torrent of roaring fire, courtesy of his left side. Fumikage Tokoyami was a vanguard fighter, having draped himself in a cloak of unstoppable might as dark shadow covered its host and acted at his orders. The many handballs that the sentient quirk had gathered in the initial assault against them were now launched back with a sweeping attack of his limbs, the bird-headed teen keeping his concentration for as long as he could. The living mass of darkness could hardly be matched, though it took a fortified will to call upon this much power while under sunlight. Thankfully there was someone assisting in giving the living quirk its boost. Midoriya Izuku casted his shadows, letting them stretch as far as possible, the area of effect of his power a gloomy and grim-looking sight. The vampire effortlessly used the black, black matter that spilled from his shadow to both subdue his adversaries as well as empower his ally. The fine control of his quirk factor was exemplary the dark tendrils acting with precisely uncanny accuracy. It spoke volumes of his skill, acquired through many hours of training. What spooked Mera the most, outside of the site itself, was that Izuku was apparently pulling on a soul quirk factor outside of his vampirism. The HSPC figurehead pulled the available files that he had on the vampire, analyzing the listed powers that he was supposed to have. Needless to say, the green-haired Hemomancer was bound to make things very interesting this year. Mara now observed the screen with attentive eyes, long forgetting his previous exhausted state to fully focus on watching the first part of the provisional license exam. He had high expectations for the vampire, as the controlled display of power he exhibited could seldom be replicated except for those heroes in top ranking. No wonder the higher-ups want him collared, he let the thought swim in his head, though he immediately banished the idea from his mind. Izuku was still a young teen, he shouldn't have been subjected to such harshness. Yet, here he was, having managed to face such challenges and overcoming them, managing to be much more heroic than some of the low-tier heroes that he had seen. Mara decided to keep his eye out for the vampire. Something told the civil worker that it would be much better to have Izuku's friendship than his enmity. He could pull a few strings, ease up the bureaucratic red tape around the teen and at least loosen the collar placed around him. He was quite sure that Midoriya would appreciate it. Laid on the parapet atop the stadium, a hidden figure observed the exam occurring with dull eyes. Quiet couldn't help scoffing at the display of the many hero hopefuls that were taking this rushed exam. Her eyes quickly scanned the field in search of her quarry, the scope granted to her by her quirk and her marksman skills made it unmatched in its precision. Finding the vampire wasn't hard, especially with his display of power claiming a domain of influence that wordlessly spoke the truth of his skill. It shouldn't be a surprise that Izuku was a good team player. He could have simply focused on his own chances to pass the test, yet had gone in the opposite way, guaranteeing a safety net for his classmates while striking fear in anyone looking at the scene. She couldn't help but want to truly test him. It was child's play for him to deal with unexperienced and green trainees from standard hero schools, Yue's crazy schedule and his lived experiences putting his way over the common trainee. Kena focused on suppressing her presence, but also focused her killing intent solely on the vampire. How would he deal with being under a hunter's mark? Would he allow paranoia to take in and mess up his flow? Or would he remain steadfast and reach her expectations of him? The sniper in her urged for a trigger to pull, for she had found her mark. To be continued. But that will be the end of this video. 
Thanks for watching this video, hope you enjoyed this story. If you did enjoy this story, please leave a like and subscribe. And join the Discord down below. And make sure to check out Blood for the Blood God and the author Ryujin Mao on fanfiction.net. The link to the story is down below. So please go check them out and support them for making this great story. But that will be the end of this video. Goodbye. Kosho out.